just a moment, our deacons are going to join me here at the table, and they're going to distribute the elements of the Lord's Supper. And I wanted us just to take a brief moment before we did that to look back to the first Lord's Supper. If you have your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 22 with me. And in Luke 22, we're going to read together what happened the first Lord's Supper. They were making preparations to celebrate the Passover, celebrating the time when God set the captives free from Egypt. Israel had been held bondage, and God set them free. And what a beautiful word picture that is for us today, that these same elements, the broken body, the shed blood of Jesus, are those things that set us free from what holds us back, namely our sin. Amen? So let's read that together. Uh, it's in Luke 22. I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. Uh, you can stand if you'd like to. To honor God's Word. God's Word tells us this, When the hour came, He, Jesus, reclined at the table, and His apostles with Him. And it's kind of hard for us to get this image of reclining at a table uh, because our tables have chairs. Uh, their tables it was probably what they called a, a triclinium. It was a three-level table, and they would just kind of sit down and lean on the steps going up to the next level. And uh, that, was, that was meant, that triclinium was that you put the most important people up high. And I can see Jesus probably on the very bottom step because he said he should, shall be last, shall become first. And he was setting an example for his disciples. But, says, he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He then took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, take it and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And uh, this is obviously a common cup that they took and passed around and shared, so they were literally all drinking from the same cup, and uh, the imagery there is that we come together at the Lord's Supper table. Remember what Psalm 134 says, oh, how good and pleasant it is for brothers to live together in harmony. And so we come together around his table, laying aside any differences we may have, and focusing on the one thing that does unite us, the blood of Jesus. He took bread, verse 19 says, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them, said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Took the cup, and he said, This cup is the new covenant established in my blood shed for you. And so in that supper, he's teaching them and teaching us about the meaning and the manner of his death. And the meaning, obviously, is redemption that we come and are redeemed. So... The significance of this supper today is not that we created it to remember Jesus, but that he gave it to us so we could remember what he did for us. Amen? Let me ask our deacons to join us here, and then I'm going to lead us in prayer, and we will distribute the elements. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we love and lift up the name of Jesus. We proclaim it, that you are absolutely Lord God and King. And we ask you, O oh Father, that you visit us here as we celebrate together your supper. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you are seated, I just want to encourage you as the music plays to use this time as a time of prayer and preparation of your own heart to receive the supper.
Scripture teaches us that the Lord Jesus on the night of his betrayal, night of his betrayal took bread and after he had given thanks, broke it, saying, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
The scripture says, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this as often as you do in remembrance of me. Brother Donnie O'Dell, would you come and lead us in a prayer of thanksgiving for the body and blood of the Lord? Thank you, gentlemen. How good it is when we come together at the Lord's table to celebrate like He instructed. And I want to tell you, we're blessed as a church, and my commitment is we never just tag the Lord's Supper on at the end of the service so we can check that box and say we did it. We sing toward it, we prepare for it, we pray toward it. And we celebrate in a wonderful way. So thank you for being that church. Thank you for being that deacon body that leads us to celebrate this way. Amen. Yeah. I have for us a short message today. Did y'all hear that? <laughs> a short message today about Dr. Luke. So turn to Luke chapter 1, if you would. And uh, Paul refers to Luke as a deeply, dearly loved physician. And you might be like me, I've always appreciated doctors, amen? And I sure appreciate those doctors who take care of God's servants. And I think there's a special place for those who do that, and that's exactly what Dr. Luke did. He gave his life to the study and practice of medicine, and in the end, he used those skills that God had given him to take care of one of God's finest servants. So let's read Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. And then we'll begin. Many have undertaken to compile a narrative about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Just as the original eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord handed them of the word handed them down to us, it also seemed good to me since I have carefully investigated everything from the very first to write to you in an orderly sequence, most honorable Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things about which you have been instructed. Father, help us as we look to your word and we look to what Dr. Luke can teach us, Father. May you, Father, help us to just be good and careful students of your word today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. There ever was a man to write a book full of good news about Jesus, it was Dr. Luke. Uh, we believe, based on tradition, that he had a medical practice in Antioch, and he ultimately left that practice to go and follow Paul around, and we'll get to that in a moment. But he gets to the main point of his message of the gospel all the way back in chapter 19, verse 10, where he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. He gives us the very purpose of Jesus' coming. And you notice in verse 3 that the original recipient of this letter was a person named the Most Honorable Theophilus. Say that with me, Theophilus. And if you break that word down, Theos means God and Phileo means lover. So his name literally is lover of God or friend of God. There's a lot of discussion in theological realms whether this is really a person or maybe it was a pseudonym for someone who was a high-ranking official perhaps in the Roman government that was asking Luke questions, and Luke researched and wrote this document for him using that false name to protect him. But in any manner, he was a person who had received instruction about Jesus, and somehow he needed more information 
more instruction, more evidence, if you will, to convince him of the truth. So I want to just show you three quick things that we can learn from Dr. Luke. The first one is this. When you minister to God's servants, you indeed are ministering to God himself. When you're ministering to God's servants, you're ministering to God himself. Listen to what Jesus had to say about this in Matthew 25. He said, The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then Jesus says this, I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. And verse 37 says, the righteous will answer him, Lord, when? When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? When did we see you a stranger or take you in or without clothes and we clothed you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer, I assure you, whatsoever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. You understand the title, when you minister to God's servants, you indeed are ministering to God himself. And think about Luke. Luke traveled with Paul the apostle. And if anybody ever needed a doctor on standby, it was, it was Paul, amen? Amen. You think about his life. He had an eye disease that caused him that when he signed his letters, he said, see with what large letters I sign my name. He probably used what we call an amanuensis, a scribe, to write his letters. And then Paul at the end would make a quote or two and sign his name. Uh, He had what he referred to as his thorn in the flesh. He was at times, I would imagine, malnourished from his many trips. He spent a night and day in the open sea. He was in danger from rivers. Three times he was shipwrecked, stoned by his enemies, beaten with rods by the Romans. Five times he received the same lashing that Jesus received on the night of his betrayal. And that list could go on and on and on. And right here, I can visualize Dr. Luke sitting there stitching Paul's back, setting his broken bones back in place, making splints, keeping Paul on the road again to make another missionary journey. And I think by Luke keeping Paul going, he was indeed ministering to the Lord himself. And and we are guilty at times of thinking that preachers are in the real ministry and the rest of us just sit around and soak it up and encourage him on. I had a guy working out at our house uh, the other day and I went and met with him on some stuff and when I was getting ready to leave, I said, uh, well, I've got to get going. I've got to get to the office. I've got work to do. He said, you mean, he knows I'm a preacher. He said, you mean you have a real job too? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so I took about 30 minutes to explain to him all the stuff I do. <laughs> He'll never ask that again. But you know, the preacher doing the work of the ministry and the people encouraging him, nothing could be farther from the New Testament truth. God's Word teaches us that each and every believer is gifted by the Holy Spirit with a special spiritual gift. And you probably have gifts that I don't have because I don't have the gift of mercy. Surely someone here has a gift of mercy, amen? And God uses our giftedness in particular ways, in particular places. And there are people that God can use you to minister to with your gifts that I could never reach with my gifts. And so as we come together, we realize Luke wasn't a preacher. He was a doctor. He was a historian. But look at how God used him as he ministered to those called by God to go and preach and share the good news. And I have no doubt that Luke was blessed, and I have no doubt that you too will be equally blessed as you minister to God's servants. You are ministering to God Himself. Secondly, this is a little wordy, so get ready. No matter our location or our vocation, we will never go on vacation. What in the world does that mean, preacher? That means we may change our address, we may change where we work, we might even retire from work. But remember this, friends, although you may retire from your vocation, you never retire from God's calling. Luke investigated and then he wrote the Gospel of Luke. Then sometime later, commentators are not clear on how much time he left, but Luke was an old man at this time. He again wrote the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. We call it the book of Acts. 
Luke wrote two of the 27 books in the New Testament. That would, just writing this gospel would be considered a lifetime achievement for anybody, but Luke wasn't done. God wasn't done with him. He said, no, Luke, I want you to write about what the Holy Spirit does through my church as it begins. God has built into the universe a need for rest. Say that word with me, rest. And if we cheat ourselves out of the Sabbath, we cheat ourselves. He's created us for rest. Even the earth, farmers know this. You have to rotate crops, and about every seven years, you've got to give this pasture a rest so it can replenish itself to produce. And if we continue to think we can produce and produce and produce and never stop and rest, we are wrong. And it's good to once in a while take a vacation, but let me tell you, never take a spiritual vacation. Many former spiritual giants in our churches, I'm not just talking about our church, but in our churches, many former spiritual giants in our churches have taken a spiritual vacation and become nothing more than spiritual bench warmers. Falling for Satan's lies that you are done. You're too old. You can't do it anymore. It's time for somebody else to take over that ministry. Let me inform you of something. You're not done until God says you're done. And your role and function may change, but God's calling on your life will never change. In recent days, I told you last Sunday how to discourage your pastor. Let me tell you how to encourage your pastor. Y'all wrote those down, didn't you, so you can be sure and use them? How to discourage me? Let me tell you some, one way you can encourage me. In recent months, I've had two widows. Some had lost their husband. One had lost their husband fairly recently. One many years ago. They came to me. They came in person. They said, Brother Mike, I want to talk to you. I, I have a, a, a need in my life. One said, I want to care for people who have someone ill at home. And I want to go and sit with them and I want to hold their hand and I want to pray for them and I want to read Scripture to them. And if they have a caregiver, I want that caregiver to go out and go shopping or go to lunch or something without having to worry about their significant person they're caring for being cared for, great. And I said, man, let me give you a list. And I had another widow just recently come to me, and she said, now th this was kind of strange to me, but this widow came and she said, I have a burden from God that I'm supposed to be taking care of other widows. Can you assign somebody to me that I can just go by and check on once in a while and pray for and love on? I gave her a list. And they're both out there ministering and loving and praying. And what they are realizing is that no matter their location, no matter their vocation, they are not on spiritual vacation. And I encourage all of us to do that. And lastly, when you serve Jesus, the rewards are so much greater than the cost. See, tradition tells us that Luke was from Antioch. He closed his practice down. He started with Paul. And we know he wrote the book of Acts but in chapter 16, this transformation takes place because he stops talking in the third person as he's writing about what Paul did and he begins to write in the first person because he was there with Paul. And he was going on these journeys with Paul as they evangelized the world. Let me tell you, if I had the opportunity to join the Apostle Paul on one of these missionary evangelistic trips, I would jump at it. I would jump at the chance to be Paul's doctor, his bus driver, his tent setter up, or his luggage carrier, whatever it would take. I would love to go with the Apostle Paul and just share the gospel all over the place. And sometimes today we look at men like Dr. Luke and we think, well, it's too bad there's not opportunities like that anymore for us. Hmm. Well, let me just tell you, there are lots of opportunities. There, there are ministries that can use every skill set that you have. You ever heard of mercy ships? They're out of Lindale, Texas of all places. And they have these big ships and they have doctors and they have nurses and they have anesthesiologists and they have uh, administrators, they have cooks, they have cleaning people. And these people volunteer two years of their time to get on a ship and go to the uttermost parts of the world to do medical clinics on their ship. And when people are on their ship, they can share the good news of Jesus Christ with those people. Isn't that just a simple way that somebody can 
take what they know and go out there and use it? What about the International Commission? You ever heard that? It's headquartered of all places in Louisville, Texas. An International Commission takes lay people, not preachers, lay people just like you, and you meet together for a few months and, and, and just, just at night after work and you get trained and they send you on an international mission trip where you can go into places that most people could never go and you can go over there and be a witness and a testimony for Jesus Christ. And it's designed just for lay people to go and do that. Have you ever heard of the North American Mission Board? I hope you have if you're Baptist. You've heard of the International Mission Board? Both of those have short-term and long-term mission trips or mission opportunities where you as a layperson can say, I want to go on a mission trip to wherever they're going, and they're going all over the place. Egypt, Tanzania, the United Arab Emirates, going all over the place. And you can go and become a short-term missionary and just go and serve. There, there's one in Grayson County, in fact. It's called Family Promise of Grayson County. Have you heard of that? In our church, once a year, there are homeless families in our county. And once a, once a quarter, so about four times a year, our church opens up our church. And we say, would y'all come be our guest and spend the night at our church for seven nights? And while they're here, we feed them and we love them. And, and we need two people to volunteer right now for that. We need one person to, to help Line up overnight hosts, just people to come up here and spend the evening eating dinner with them and then spend the night uh, in the CLC. Do, do y'all all sleep? Do y'all sleep at night? You're all qualified. And then the other thing we need is someone who can organize meals. Now I can tell you, I can go around the room and point to the ones that I know know how to eat. <laughs> Starting right here. So I know we all eat. And we need somebody to organize some meals. So right there is an opportunity for you to minister right here in our community. Today, at 12 o'clock, as soon as the service is over, there are three people from our church. Myself, my wife April, Diana So. Would you stand up back there, Diana? We're going to leave, and we're going to put on our yellow shirts and yellow hats to say SPTC Disaster Relief Chaplains, and we're driving to Powderly, Texas, where the tornado hit on Friday. And we're just going to start walking the neighborhood and asking the Lord to direct us who we need to go talk to and how we need to minister. And then on Monday, Susan Bateman's going with me and Jim Covington. And so you got five people from our church right now that are fixing to go out. Did y'all get those names? Me, April, Diana, Susan, and Jim. Would you just pick one of those names right now and pray for them over the next few days? We'll be there today through about Wednesday. Some of us going and coming back and forth. So pray for that group as they go. And all these opportunities have one thing in common. You know what it is? God's rewards are greater than the cost. God's rewards are greater than the cost. You can go as a teacher, an administrator, an agriculturist, a well driller, a computer guru. Just any skill you have, God can use it to re reach this world for Christ. So I want to ask you a question. Like Dr. Luke. Would you be willing to say to God, Lord, wherever you send me, I'm packing my bag right now. I'm ready to go. I'm willing. And if you're willing, I believe God will provide the opportunity and the place for you to serve Him. Would you stand and pray with me? Oh, Father, you haven't called us to sit around a church building and do nothing You've called us to engage the world. And so, Father, help us listen carefully to your Holy Spirit as you speak to us now. Help us, Lord, to be responsive as you do speak to us. And we expect you, Lord, to speak to us right now. As you call us out, Lord, help us be ready with a yes. Lord, I've learned if we'll just say yes when you call, you work out the details as only you can. And great and wonderful things happen when we say yes to you, God. Call us out, Lord. Some of you may be calling to salvation right now, that they came today and realize I've never trusted this Jesus that Dr. Luke wrote about. I'm like Theophilus. I need you some more information. But your Spirit, Lord, is working their heart right now, convincing them 
that they need to come and receive you as their Savior. There are some here today, Lord, that are saying, you know, I feel like the Holy Spirit is calling me to go somewhere, and I'm not sure where that is. Well, be like Abram. He left his home and his family, and he went to an unknown country. But he was following you, his known God, and how you blessed him and the Jewish nation through him. Father, you're calling to some right now that have been saved and never baptized. Come down this aisle and swallow their pride and say, I need to follow Jesus in baptism and stand before a group of believers and say, I confess my faith in Christ. There are those you're calling to church membership or renewal of their commitment, Lord. You're speaking today. Would you give us that irresistible calling that we have to step out of our pew and come down and make that decision right now? We pray it, Lord, in Jesus' name.